Before I start, I'd like to think a little bit about big data. We live in an incredibly data-rich world, and what we can do with that data these days is quite impressive. But do you know what the difference is between association and causation? And do you think that data can help us answer questions on causal relationships? So could there be a causal link between how tall you are or how fat you are and your socioeconomic status? So I'm going to talk a little bit about different sources of data. And I'm going to try and highlight some of the pitfalls of data analysis. So as I said, everywhere about us is data. You've all been asked to switch your smartphones off, but let me guarantee you that they're there happily collecting data. Mine cheerfully tells me how many steps I've taken and how much activity I've done each day. And they can do so much more than that. Look at our Olympic and Paralympic athletes. We monitor their diets, their training, and we look at to try and optimize performance as much as possible. People like politicians rely, sometimes erroneously, on data to tell them when to have a referendum. And then there are people like me who try and use data to improve our understanding of health and disease. So not everyone's a fan of a spreadsheet, let's be honest, but data comes in lots and lots of different formats. When I speak to other people about data, Normally, I see a sort of glazed look come over people's faces. And people also have some interesting ideas about it. They think it's complicated, sometimes irrelevant, misleading, and even confusing. And I have to say, I'd agree on that on several occasions. You only have to look in the press. Red wine's been good for us one week, and then the next week, well, we probably shouldn't have that extra glass because, you know, it's going to cause us problems. But, at the same time, data can be incredibly useful if it's used correctly. One of the things that infuriates me on those kind of television adverts is when you see that, you know, 90% of women think that their hair is glossier and brighter, and then you see in the small print that they've asked 20 people. Come on, <laughs> is that really relevant? But hopefully, if we think about data in the correct way, it can be incredibly useful. So, let's highlight a few things to think about. So the next time you see something in the national press saying that X is associated with Y, you can start to think, how have they done this? And does it make sense? The first thing to think about is whether it does make sense. So as researchers, we tend to start with a question. But with big data, there's something now called data mining. Sounds exactly like it is, really. You take a big data set, you stick it in, you do some statistical gee wizardry, and you find out what is associated with what. But what does that really mean? This is a really nice example from the US census data. In blue, we've got the divorce rate in Maine. And in red, we've got the consumption of margarine. And this is from 2000 to 2009. And you can see that those lines follow each other incredibly well. In fact, they're correlated to 99%. Fantastic. I found the way to happy marriages. We're going to ban margarine. And everybody will be delighted. Let's stop and think about that. Does it really make sense that margarine is going to influence how well people get on in their married lives? I think most of us would agree that you'd struggle to find even a very tenuous link between the two. So the first thing to think about is, does it make sense? Can we see a reason for that relationship? Is there other studies that relate those two things together? We then have to think about things that can influence those particular relationships. So if X is associated with Y, could there be something else annoying, like Z, in the middle, causing problems? This is known as confounding. And let me give you an example. There's been studies that are interested in coffee drinking. So we've looked at how coffee relates to things like lung cancer. 
And interestingly, they saw that the more cups of coffee people had, the higher their risk of lung cancer was. And similarly, alcohol. Everybody loves to study alcohol. And there's been lots of relationships with things like cardiovascular disease. But there's something that generally, if you do do this option, if you drink more coffee and you drink more alcohol, you tend to smoke more if you're a smoker. And what they found in this coffee study was actually when they accounted for people smoking, there was no relationship anymore between coffee and lung cancer. Similarly, with alcohol and things like cardiovascular disease, by the time you start accounting for things like cigarette smoking, those relationships become much, much weaker. So it's really important to think about other factors that might be involved in that relationship. That could be things like age, sex, your socioeconomic status, your intelligence, all sorts of things can confound relationships. And the final issue we have with data is one of those general problems. The classic chicken and egg situation. What comes first? So if you imagine we've got a data set of diabetics and some non-diabetics as well, and we want to look and compare the differences between the two of them. We see that in our diabetics, there's one chemical in your blood that's much, much higher than in your non-diabetics. Does that mean that chemical has a causal role in the development of diabetes? And if we target it, we're going to cure the disease or help people with that condition? Or is it simply that by developing diabetes, something in the body has gone wrong and that chemical has gone up? So when we're looking at relationships in data, it's not just important to think about whether the relationship makes sense. It's also to think, could that relationship go the other way as well? So now that I've convinced you that all is really doom and gloom when you've got a big data set, what can we actually do to make data help us answer lots of questions? Well, in the world I work in, the best standard of evidence is a randomized control trial. Now, in that, we would probably have some clinical outcome. So I'm going to stick with diabetes because it's what I know. And we're going to be looking at a clinical drug. A drug companies come up with a drug, and they want to know if that can help diabetes control. So what we do is we randomize people into two groups. Some of them are going to get that new drug, whereas others are going to continue on a known medication already. We're then going to follow those people over time, and we're going to see how their diabetes is controlled. Now, the key things here, we've got an important question. Does this drug help with diabetes? We are randomizing people into groups. And that's really important when we're worrying about those other factors that might mess up our relationships. So people are randomized regardless of their age, their sex, whatever their favorite color is. They just get randomized into different groups. And we're also following people over time so we can see which direction our relationship is going in. But unfortunately, and I'm sure you can all imagine, we can't use a clinical trial for everything. Firstly, they're incredibly expensive and time-consuming. And secondly, you can't answer every question with one. You certainly wouldn't get ethics for some of the questions we might like to look at. For example, imagine things where you're wanting to look at the health effects of alcohol. Probably wouldn't get permission to randomize people into drinking lots and lots of alcohol. So, what else can we do? Well, we can use longitudinal study designs. So that's things where we collect data at regular time points, and we can collect lots of additional information, and that can help us with that confounding issue. But from my background, I like genetics, and I'm going to argue that we can use genetics in many of those situations to help us answer questions. So how many of you can remember your school biology? I'm just going to give you a very, very brief Genetics 101. So in all the cells in your body, you've got a nucleus. And within that nucleus, you've got deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA, the code of life. Now, actually, in each cell, you've got a lot of the stuff. It's compacted up incredibly small. But if we unwrapped it, it would cover several football pitches. And it's got this amazing structure. It's got this sort of backbone 
And then across the middle, you've got struts, effectively. And those are the bases. They are your actual code. And all humans, we have four bases in our DNA. And that's what makes up who we are. And if I took all of you in this room and I sequenced that code, you'd all match up incredibly well. But at particular points in your DNA, I'd be able to split this room. I could move some of you over that way and some of you over that way. And those points are genetic variants or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And they are associated with a lot of the traits that we can see. So your genetics contributes to how tall you are. It'll contribute to your BMI. It can contribute to how much you smoke if you're a smoker. It can influence levels of chemicals within your blood. And it's these variants that we can use to help us understand causal relationships. So let's go back to my, one of my original questions. Can BMI or height cause differences in socioeconomic status? So if we think about what I said, the question makes sense. There's certainly lots of evidence out there that there is a relationship between socioeconomic status and height and BMI. Most studies look at it in the reverse to the way I'm asking that question. So people have shown that if you're from a lower socioeconomic status background, chances are you have slightly poorer diet, slightly poorer lifestyle choices, and that can stunt your growth in childhood. And it can also influence your body mass index, both in childhood and adulthood. So there's definitely a reason for a relationship there. But could it possibly go the other way? It's not easy to answer with a randomized control trial. But helpfully, we do have rather a large number of genetic variants that are related to your BMI and your height. And just to point out that I'm afraid you can't blame your genetics for everything, because your genes and your environment make up what we see. And in fact, genetics explains quite a small proportion. So for all the height genes we know about, that only explains about 10% of the variation in height. So how do we use this as a tool? Well, we want to look at that relationship, BMI or height on socioeconomic status. It could go either way, and there are going to be a lot of confounders. Your age, your sex, your intelligence, all sorts of things are going to influence that relationship. And that can make it very hard in an observational understudy study to see the wood from the trees. And this is where genetics comes in. So we have 90 genetic variants that relate to BMI and over 400 for height, which basically means if I took everyone in this room, I could plot you somewhere on a normal curve for how much your genetics contributes to your height or your BMI. Now, your genetics are set at birth, which means that you're randomized to all other phenotypes. So I can effectively use your genetics to turn you into a randomized control trial. So let's say this half of the room has a lower genetic BMI, and this half of the room has got a higher genetic BMI. All other phenotypes we don't worry about because they're set at birth and they're not going to change. So we can look at that relationship regardless of confounding factors. So if my genetic variants for BMI or height associate with socioeconomic status, then there is a causal relationship there. So we did this. We used a great study of half a million people called the UK Biobank. And we looked at five different measures of socioeconomic status, two relating to education, one to income, one to your job class, and one to uh, a general deprivation measure, which looks at things like whether you own a car and a house, etc. And we looked at our genetic variants. And when we looked in everyone, wasn't that exciting. What we saw was if you were that little bit taller, then you did seem to be a little bit better off, a little bit more likely to have a degree, a little bit likely to earn a bit more. Same with BMI didn't really seem to make that much difference. So if you were that little bit fatter, there did seem to be a relationship with being that little bit worse off. 
but not massively. And then we thought, I wonder if sex has anything to do with this. Let's look in males and females separately. And that's what we did. And that's when we started to see some really interesting results. So uh, I'm going to show you the next slide, which comes from the Telegraph publish, uh, publishing of this work. Uh, so this was published in the British Medical Journal earlier this year. And this is sort of what the Telegraph came up with. And I think it's quite a nice way of sort of displaying the data. But it does only relate to income. Uh, and, but we did see similar findings across the board. So when we looked in women, we actually saw that it was BMI that was incredibly important. So effectively, our data were telling us that for every stone a woman gained in weight, there was about a £1,500 reduction in annual household income. Whereas BMI for men didn't really seem to have any effect at all. So BMI is obviously an important factor there. And in men, it was height that seemed to have a particular role. So for a man, if he's three inches shorter, that equated to about the same income loss as we saw in women. So three inches reduction in height, £1,500 reduction in income. We didn't go into why there might be a causal relationship there. That's beyond us geneticists. We stop at this point. But you could imagine that it might be something to do with unconscious discrimination, self-confidence of that individual, or perhaps the way we as society idealise particular body types. We tend to think of big, strong men as being an ideal. And with women, you know, tall, elegant, thin models tend to be very much idealised in the press and social media. And perhaps it's these factors that are driving this relationship. So research now needs to look at why being that little bit fatter as a woman or that little bit shorter as a man could lead you worse off in life. And I hope today I've given you a little bit of an insight into some of the issues with data. And the next time you read that X is associated with Y in the press, have a think. What kind of study have they done? Does it make sense? Should I be following this example? Thank you very much.